Hi everyone and uh, thank you for joining us which is for a special session I suppose um, that we felt was really important because uh, the Children, Youth and Family team have been exploring some of the issues that um, have been experienced by people especially during this time of uh, COVID-19 and, and holiday hunger and food poverty was a subject that, that came up on a number of occasions. So we wanted to um, explore that a little bit more. So we have a special focus on social media this afternoon um, and this week, in fact, exploring that. And we're really pleased that we've invited a few folk who are already involved in this ministry to come and share about some of their experiences uh, in the hope that uh, that will help us to learn a little bit about um, perhaps what we could be doing in response to this, particularly because the school holidays uh, begin, I think, probably in the next couple of weeks. Um, so we thought that that was something really important for now. So let's just uh, introduce ourselves. Uh, I'm Gail Adcock. I work with the Children, Youth and Family Team. Lynn. I'm Lynn. I also work with the Children, Youth and Family Team. Catherine. Hello, I'm Catherine. I'm the project leader at Make Lunch Romsey. And we've been serving lunches to families since 2017. Thank you, Sam. Hi, I'm Sam Barnes. I'm the circuit youth worker for the Winchester, Eastleigh and Romsey circuit and I help facilitate children's youth and families work within that circuit, which includes the Make Lunch project in Romsey. Brilliant. Thank you. And Julian. Hi, I'm the Reverend Julian Orbrow and I am at St Thomas Methodist Church in Exeter and I am uh, running a project called the Community Larder. Thanks so much everyone. Um, the first question we have to, to ask our panel uh, is about the changes that they've observed in families' food needs. Uh, what do you think are the greatest needs currently? Uh, so we're going to start by going to Julian first, if that's okay. Yes, of course. Hi. We were aware right from the beginning of um, the, the uh, lockdown that there were families all of a sudden experiencing uh, hardship, financial difficulties, uh, food poverty, and they've never experienced it before. They've not been on any uh, systems. They didn't know how to navigate themselves through it. And so we set up a community larder, working with um, other partners, particularly the local schools, the doctor surgery, the wellbeing, and the community builders, uh, to develop a, a real sense of a relationship so that we could uh, help people in those needs and we provide a weekly food package for families in need. Fantastic, thank you Julian. And Sam, what needs have you noticed? Um, totally agree with what Julian has just said. Uh, and the, one of the needs that we've uh, noticed is, is the fact that with the benefits that people receive, if they lose their jobs through COVID, if they've been on furlough, uh, take five weeks. To, to actually arrive, they took five weeks to start, which means there's that aspect of uh, lack of income and poverty during that time. There was a report issued by the government released on the 6th of July called, called Hungry for Change, Fixing Failures in Food. And it looks at that aspect. And one of the things it says, point 85, and I'll, I'll read that one to you, says, mm -hmm. a factor of food poverty or food insecurity that makes it perhaps more visible than other forms of poverty is that often food is the budget and the only budget which can be reduced. Cuts can be made to a food budget that cannot be made to rent or fuel. Helen Bernard says that it's quite often the first thing that people on low income start cutting back or making trades about. Parents start skipping meals. Food insecurity arises quite logically out of a lack of resources and does not exist in isolation from other kinds of poverty. Someone skipping meals is going, and someone who's going to be going without is going without other things as well, which is another consideration of food poverty, which has been on that increase because unfortunately people have lost their jobs or they've been put on fire. Yeah, it's a much wider issue than just food. It's just food that is, is, is the most visible symptom, isn't it? Mm. Uh, and Catherine, do you have any other um, insights or things that you've noticed with regards to changes in need? Well, I would agree with the, the points already raised that, yes, it's those people that find themselves in this position for the first time that, yeah, have no idea 
um, where to begin looking for support. Mm. Thank you. So it would be great to perhaps for you to share a little bit more in detail about the, the work and ministry that you've been, been doing during this time. Um, I, I think I've, I sort of picked up that there's um, something about people's um, first time of, of experiencing this, this level of um, kind of need, I suppose. So, um, Catherine, do you want to tell us um, a bit more about how your uh, project is trying to make a difference? How are you sort of feeding people who are local to you? Well, in previous years, we've, we've really concentrated on offering a, a good quality two course lunch with a sort of a, a restaurant experience to it. Um, we find ourselves in a very different position this year, um, but we still want to encourage the people to come to our building so that we can chat with them and build a relationship. So we've decided to sort of offer a more simplified menu with um, available as takeaways but hopefully, if the numbers allow, we will encourage them to, to stay on site. Um, and then we'll be able to, you know, to build relationships and find out if there's anything else we can do to help them. So what sort of food have you offered in the past then? You said, I think, a, a restaurant experience. And that, that sounded uh, rather marvellous to me. <laughs> well, probably that's a, a bit grand. Um, <laughs> but yes, we usually do... Uh, a sort of a Sunday lunch one day um, and it's amazing that it's the parents that love the fruit crumbles and custard. <laughs> Most children sort of you know turn their nose up at warm custard on a fruit crumble um, <laughs> but the parents are always sort of reminisce of it you know of that's what they enjoy. Uh, mm. There's something that's perhaps comforting isn't there in those those sorts of puddings that's that, that's how I feel about them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so yes, we make sure that we offer them a balanced meal usually. Okay. So a little bit of a, a change though in, in this time that you've had to adjust, I suppose, to circumstances. Yes, I, I mean, we'll still make sure that it's um, top quality fresh food um, with fruit and, you know, available. Um, but yes, it will be simplified. And, and Sam, has that been kind of quite a, a, a straightforward thing to sort of transition to doing, is, is doing, doing this in a different way? Uh, I would say not. It's, it's had its uh, implications. Uh, Catherine sent me through the risk assessment this morning to have a look at. That's huge uh, in order to do it properly, because obviously you have to do things safely, which is one of the reasons that uh, Make Lunch didn't operate in at Easter when it normally would have, and that was with much regret from the, the church and the church council when they decided that it wasn't something that could be done. Uh, so there are elements of risk that you need to bear in mind. There are things you need to put in place, and one of the decisions this time is that along with the food hunger, we look at the relationships that we have with the people that attend on building the relationships with the family to investigate more and to find out more of how they are and how they're doing and how they're feeling, which we won't be able to do as much in August because the interaction won't be as much. Mm -hmm. So that again, that's not ideal, but the need is still to feed the people. The need is still to offer the opportunity for people to have those meals. Mm -hmm. So although it is going to be very different, it is meeting a need. We still w would like it to return to the way it was when we could have those conversations that we could speak to the people and that we could you know engage with them more but obviously in this day and age at this moment in time we can't facilitate that in that way but we can meet the need of feeding them which is exceptionally important julian what about over in in exeter um what have you been doing during this time to meet some of this need we particularly started by sending out um, parcels of food to families who we've identified or have been referred to us. Uh, but um, because we're fortunate enough, we're a very close-knit community, we did have the opportunity to be able to, to, to talk and uh, get to know a lot of people, and a lot of them we already knew. So it wasn't just food. Um, we were aware that um, for some families, paper, felt tips, uh, some colouring books, 
they, even we supplied them, um, we're very fortunate we had managed to get from the education authority some um, maths and English literacy books for five to seven year olds and that sort of thing. So we provided things like that. And also we provided um, with the food and we were, the aim was to make sure that we could, um, they could eat a, a breakfast and a, a lunch and, a, and an evening meal for, for seven days. Uh, so that it's right across the line. But also we wanted to make sure that they could have a bit of fun with it. So we had competitions like a bake off and we provided flour and um, uh, raisins and that sort of thing so that they could um, uh, grow, uh, 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 cook their own food. And then we started providing um, things for them to grow in that as well, just to, so that there was the whole sense of well-being and wholeness for, for everyone. So it, it, it's meeting uh, people's needs and getting to know that family and helping them through what is very difficult times and, and uncertain times. And um, I, I've picked up as well, I think, through some of what you've been, um, what you shared with us earlier, which is that there's something about tailoring the need to, to families because actually each family has their own unique circumstances. Yeah, yes, uh, I mean, one example, we had uh, one family who were particularly concerned that their washing machine had broken down and they, they weren't quite sure how they could get the money to fix it. So we agreed that they were going to get the washing machine fixed. They paid for that. And we provided three weeks of food, uh, which freed up the money so that they could do that. And I think it is important that we target the areas. We've also um, identified for some families that they've got very young children, making sure that they've got nappies and making sure that they've got some baby mm -hmm. food. And, and even, and I know it, it seems silly, but sometimes it's forgotten. If families have got pets and they've got real difficulty, it, just making sure and finding out, have you got a cat or a dog or a, a rabbit? Do you need a bit of help? And we've provided food for their pets as well. So it's just, you know, I, I think it's important that we make sure that we treat people with dignity and respect and as unique individuals. Yeah, and there's um, something about the fact that obviously they they don't come and collect the food, do they? It gets delivered out to them. Yeah, an awful lot of them don't come. I mean, some do uh, come, but most of them, uh, we have got a, an organisation called Three Movement, uh, who are a group of cyclists and keep fit fanatics. So um, they've managed to put um, uh, trailers on their bikes and they drive around the city or ride around the city delivering these parcels for us. So it's lovely. So that's saved uh, the anxiety of people having to go out and, and try come down and collect it. Because I think sometimes th there can be a bit of a stigma. Uh, I don't think there should be, but there is of people feeling that they've got to come and ask for, for charity. Whereas this is a way of, of being able to meet their needs in, in a dignified way for them. Yeah. I, I love that sense that different sort of organisations and different bodies are sort of joining up and working with one another. And that's, um, that's very apparent in how people are sort of, yes, if someone's got a bike and can cycle, actually you can help us and be part of this. Sam, is that kind of something that you're sort of working together? I know you mentioned about schools, but is that, that, that partnership element seems quite key to me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, partnership's very key because it, it helps you identify the need. Um, it gives you support. It also gives you more ability to do more things. So, for example, um, when Catherine put together the Make Lunch programme for August, she consulted with other churches from other denominations in the area to establish what was in place there so that almost every day can be covered, rather than the Methodist church trying to cover every day themselves, actually thinking, do you know what, we can make a really good job of doing two days a week. And actually, the Baptist church can make a really good job of doing two days a week, etc. So working in partnership is a, is a really good way forward and it also demonstrates to those that come that if you say to them do you know what we're open on tuesday and thursday the baptist church is open on monday and wednesday go to them those days come to us these days and then they can see that we're working together as well which promotes a, a good sense of um of that inclusion with all that's great fantastic um I, I find these conversations really moving because for me this is exactly where the church needs to be and it's it's real kingdom stuff and hopefully other people watching this uh, might feel a little bit inspired and a little bit of a nudge to, to do something themselves. Um, if there was a church or an individual out there who was thinking about doing something what would be your 
your top tips and uh, and perhaps if they're feeling a little bit overwhelmed uh with the size of the job uh what, what would be your words of encouragement as well uh could we start with you sam please uh yes sure words of encouragement i'm actually going to start with some words from scripture thinking about it it's um there's two passages one from deuteronomy uh, chapter 15 verse 11 that says there will always be poor people in the land therefore i command you to be open-handed towards your fellow israelites who are poor and needy mm. so we we need to be open and then in james 2 15 to 17 suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food if one of you says to them go in peace keep warm and well fed but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? Mm. In the same way, by faith itself, if it is not accompanied by action, it's dead. So I love the fact that actually we are in our faith told, you know, instructed to help and, and to be there. Um, I, I would definitely say work with schools, go to school, see, see how you can work alongside them. And uh, that's a good starting point. Uh, mm -hmm. one, one thing with encouragement as well would be if you, if you get a project going and something that Julian mentioned earlier about stigma and about sometimes people feel oh I can't go there is in the welcoming and in the way we do stuff is if, if you have food that you want to give them at the end rather than say oh do you need this mm -hmm. is actually say do you know what we're going to put a load of food on the table and if there is anyone that you know that you feel would like that please take it for them so if they're then taking that that food from there they say i'm taking it for a friend mm -hmm. and actually that makes it slightly easier for them to engage in that process mm -hmm. because it's taking away that stigma stigma part so yeah as julian quite rightly said earlier being totally welcoming mm -hmm. and non-judgmental in, in what we do so yeah definitely worth doing definitely worth doing. <laughs> that's a great tip and, and julian how about you words of encouragement and top tips what would you offer certainly i, I reinforce what sam has said work with the community work with um other partners and make sure that you are working together we've used as our logo love your neighbor and that's what we've got to remind ourselves we are all neighbors mm. and um, it's a great privilege uh, to, to be able to be involved with it i've been absolutely blessed seeing the way the community has rallied round and the things that people have done to help. Um, communities have set up uh, WhatsApp for their own little area and have, have sort of raised money or raised goods and brought down to us. We've had, um, when we first started, we had no idea where we were gonna get the food or whether we'd have the resources. And yet every week, uh, and now at the moment, we're, we're giving out about 150 carrier bags of food a week. Wow. We are having that amount brought in plus extra. And some weeks we've sort of gone at the beginning of the week saying, well, perhaps we're going to have to spend some money this week mm -hmm. and buy some bread or buy some washing powder or this, that and the other. And, and believe it or not, the first few bags that have come in have had the very things that we were low on. <laughs> God blesses. So my word of encouragement is, is that you might not feel you can do it, but God can do it. You know, just step out in faith. Be amazed what happens. Fantastic. Thank you, Gillian. And Catherine, do you have any insight or wisdom that you'd like to add? Well, you just need to talk to people. You know, you might think it sounds like a, a big thing to do, but I think you find when you speak to people, just planting ideas you'll be amazed at what experience some people have that you might not have known about um you need to talk to your local food bank um because they'll have some expertise that they can help you with uh, as well um i say we are part of the tlg make lunch program um and they've been excellent you know we did our initial training with them um, and they're constantly there to to help you to guide you to keep you informed um so so yes make sure you use all the resources around you and and we've really enjoyed doing it as a church you know we've got a fantastic team of of caterers and helpers and um and we love being together and we love eating with the families um, and it's a real practical faith in action that's great. That's a great note to end on. Thank you so much. 
Um, I just want to thank uh, Julian and Sam and Catherine to, for coming to share with us this afternoon. Uh, it's been a, a real great experience and uh, I want to thank those people who've taken the time to, to watch this video. If you have been inspired and you would like to find out more about the issues or learn a bit more about uh, the project that Catherine mentioned, uh, TLG Make Lunch, you can find all the information you need at methodist.org.uk forward slash holiday hunger. Thank you very much for joining us.